Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode where I interview entrepreneurs, authors, influencers, and people on the cutting edge for the audience. And today I'm really happy to have Steve Selengut, and he comes from the financial services industry, and he is known as the income independence coach, which I love severing your the relationship between time and money. He's also got he's also the author of Retirement Money Secrets, which you can see in the background if you're on YouTube or on video. And I'm really happy to have him on the show to talk about finance, financial independence, saving, you know, bread and butter topics for the audience. So Steve, welcome. Great to be here. Great to be here. Yeah, I know uh, we've been having uh, we we're excited to have you on and get you on and record. So talk about, you know, what, um, you know, your story and how you got started and what you do. Well, I, I really got started pretty young. Um, my dad was a, a builder developer in uh, North Jersey at a, at kind of a resort type area called Lake Opacock <clears throat> about 45 minutes in those days from the city, probably three hours now. But, um, he taught me about how he went about running this business and how he generated income. And it wasn't so much the, uh, the value of the land that was important to him. It was the income that he produced by having rental properties, taking back mortgages and stuff like that. So he had sources of income, he even insured the people's homes and cars and stuff like that. So he had cash flow from several different sources. And as when I was young and doing those odd jobs that kids do during the summers, he was teaching me to constantly put away a little of it. And he'd show me the savings account that he'd put it in. He said, you see this? This is called interest. And you can just be sitting there or lying on the beach. And that interest is accumulating just because they're using your money. And he sort of taught me the lesson about never placing money in any type of situation that doesn't generate some form of income for you. So I never got hooked into zero coupon bonds, for example. And I never bought IPOs, you know, so I missed the big ones, but I didn't lose on all the other ones. There are more of them go south than go north. So I was I was taught very quickly about that. And um, when I was 25, when I was 25, I got the unused tuition payments from my, you know, college savings and uh, the results of investing all this money I was giving him to invest for me over the years. And it turned out it was quite a substantial sum back in 19, uh, what was that, 74, you know, 1970 when I was 25. So I, I invested this and I, I, I learned how to trade and I looked at the charts and I saw the fluctual volatility and the securities and the dividends coming in. And I started trading and only trading these upper echelon securities like Exxon and IBM and Xerox at the time and you know Pfizer, all the all the big name type securities you would think of. And by the time I was by the time I was, what, 34, in, in 1979, I was making about five times my salary in income from both of these two streams of income, the dividends and the profit taking. And I uh, quit my job in New York and I said goodbye and I stopped paying all the costs of commuting. And I, I lassoed two of my closest friends and told them, showed them my picture and said, look, this is what I did for my portfolios. Let me do this for you. And they agreed. So I started business with two clients, maybe, maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars under management back in in uh, 79. And I sold my business last year when it was when I had about 110 million under management. So that's the story. Now I now I try to teach other people how to make money with their investments. I look at their portfolios. I say, you're making two and a half, three percent. You should be making closer to ten percent in the current interest rate environment, and uh, I can get you there. And that's about it. That's that's the story. That's mm. the story. Yeah, I love that. 
And, uh, you know, what's interesting is because, um, you know, I'm a Gen X millennial and, uh, you know, like um, I talked to a lot of millennials and Gen Z and there's a lot of different um, concepts and there's a lot of different things that they'll take a little bit more risk. But you know, one thing I want to ask you is uh, what was interesting is this um, idea of um, so, you know, my grandparents, they were they were saying uh, bank on Social Security you know, when you're 60 or whatever, whatever the right. age is now. And then my parents were saying pensions and 401ks, you know, bank on that. And now like kind of our generation is like, that's not going to work. Government's in too much debt, inflation. But um, you talk about this idea of um, what's wrong with 4% annual withdrawal rule for 401ks. And that got me to thinking is like, you know, if you do a three to 4% is like, 30 to 40 K a year, that's not going to be enough to, you know, sustain you. So talk about, talk about what's wrong with that. Well, the idea of people using three to 4%, 4% or more of their market value of their secure, of their portfolios in retirement is a good estimate. It's not a bad idea. It's how they go about getting the 4% that is to me uh, just totally not getting the job accomplished properly. I mean, I set up an account and it's yielding. It's income generation is well more than 6%. And I can do that in any environment. I was doing that, you know, just two years ago when interest rates were zero. It wasn't a problem. It's not a problem now. But Wall Street seems more to focus on market value of the securities. Let's throw it all in the stock market. The stock market grows better than the bond market. uh uh-huh. We get paid on amount under management. So we want a growing market value. We'll sell 4% a year of a, of a customer's assets to provide him with income. But our market value will probably still go up anyway because the market just does. But it doesn't do it every year. Mm-hmm. If you'll remember 2022, so the market was down yeah, 15% maybe. Well, you also had to take out 4%. You had to sell securities to get the 4%. That might have caused some losses in itself, but your net loss was 19%. Now, this year, we've gone up 25%. But as of today, we're probably only 5% above where we were in 2000 the end of 2021 so almost three years of total five percent that's less than one percent growth per year or not really it's less than two percent growth a year but still that means most people have had a net withdrawal of capital from their portfolios my Hmm. portfolios during that period of time my own personally the ones i was managing up until may of last year we're generating close to double digit income because of you know the nature of things in the in the securities I use. I use a different form of security. It's a, a different kind of fund. You all know, everybody knows about ETFs and mutual funds. And everybody also should know that ETFs and mutual funds contain all the individual equities that are in the stock market. And all the individual corporate bonds, government bonds, municipal bonds, mortgages, real estate, all the other types of um, marketable securities are contained in some of those ETFs and mutual funds. So you don't need to be in the stock market to be in the stock market. You can be in, you know, funds. But there's one other fund that not too many people know about. And I don't know if you yourself have used them or not, or been introduced to them, but they've been around longer even than mutual funds. Oops. Oops. Can't have that. They've been around longer than mutual funds. I apologize. Um, I turn, I I always try to turn everything off. But, uh, (laughs) all right. So these closed-end funds that I'm talking about were developed in the early 1800s. I think they were probably developed in Europe, but it's hard to actually pinpoint it. But 30 years before mutual funds, they existed. Over 100 years before 
ETFs. ETFs are new. They only started in the 90s. Hmm. Uh, but these things are different. They contain the same securities as the other guys, but they're not market value focused. They're, they're actually passed through trusts. And you probably have a pass through trust or two in your estate planning environment where the money's going to go on to the next generation and so on. Well, pass through trusts are required by law to pay out 95% of the income that they make. So it differs from ETFs and mutual funds because their goals are to grow the market value. That's what they're concerned about for the most part. Uh, closed end funds, you're not going to see them grow in market value a lot. So you're never going to see them in 401k menus. You're never going to see them in a portfolio that's managed by a professional because they don't, they're not intended to grow. They're intended to produce income. And if you, if I could, I would show you, I could show you a list of 200 closed end funds, individual closed end funds that pay over 6% income to their shareholders. I could show you 40 or 50 municipal bond funds that pay an average of 5%. And they're just not very well known, but they exist. They've been around for decades. Um, they're consistent, they're safe, they're conservative. I mean, and you can invest in almost anything you want to and reap that kind of an income as a benefit. What you're not going to have, what you're not going to have, you're not going to have that ego trip of, say, oh, my account's just gone up to an all-time high. It's the highest it's ever been in, in, in history, and I feel so rich. So I ask, I ask you, I ask most people that I come into in a coaching environment, I say, how much income is your investment portfolio giving you that you could go and spend, that you could take that next European vacation or, or Caribbean cruise with without touching your principal? Do you have enough income to do that? And nine times out of 10, the answer will be, no, I don't. No, I don't. I'm, I'm counting on market value to produce my income, you know, to sell stuff, to, buy, to spend what I have to spend, buy the car, whatever. So Retirement Money Secrets is based on a conversation that I have with a couple that my wife and I meet on a, on a cruise from uh, Amsterdam to uh, Switzerland. And we talk to these people and we talk to them and I'm talking to them all the time about how they had to sell some mutual funds to pay for the trip, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I go through and I teach them from all the fundamentals of investing and talk, talk about closed end funds and how they differ, what some people consider problems about them and, and other types of things. And um, eventually they get the option of choosing whether they want to do this themselves or have somebody manage it for them and so on. Hmm. But, uh, but that's the difference. That's, that's what I've discovered. The 4% rule is a great rule. It's easy to produce 4% income. Anybody can do it. You don't have to be a rocket scientist and you don't have to take great risks. It's easy, but they right. don't do it. Yeah, I love this um, idea. And so, you know, kind of talk about the other question I had um, in your, um, was this uh, idea was, um, what is this idea of um, the difference between growth in market value and growth in working capital? I'm I'm just curious about that concept. What is that? It's a lot like uh, oh, let's see. If you if you're playing Monopoly, all right, and you have one house on the board, and it keeps growing in market value and growing in market value and growing in market value, but all the guys around you, when they roll the dice, they don't land on your property and pay rent. Right? <laughs> so it's not generating you any income. It's just making you feel good. It's it's either it's now it's one house, now it's a hotel, now it's whatever, but it's not generating the income. With market value, when that first house goes up in price, you sell it, and you now have two houses on different properties and you try to rent them. And then as this continues and you take more and more profits, you're adding more and more productive 
entities to your portfolio that are generating income. Like with closed-end funds, I own 200 different closed-end funds, each of them an average yield of 9% right now. And even if one of them went out of business, I'd still be making more than enough income to provide my 4%, wouldn't I? But if I owned the same number of securities paying no income, I'd be having to sell to get that 4%. Well, this this base this base of securities, the cost of that is the working capital. That's what's working to produce your income. If I have a hundred thousand dollars yielding yielding five thousand, okay. If it goes up in market value, it's still only yielding five thousand. If it goes up in market value, and I take the profit, and now I have a hundred and two yielding 5%, I have more than 5,000. And all those little incremental additions to capital produce more income. And mm. that, and if you have enough income, you never have to sell things, reducing capital to pay your expenses. Mm. So working capital, just by definition, it's, it's investments, the cost basis of the investments that are working to produce your income. Market value is just how much you can buy and sell. I love that. I just, it's very, um, so for example, like dividends or like bonds, um, real estate, things like that. It's more capital efficient versus just uh, watching your net net uh, net worth go up. The other question I have is uh, you have so many, I, I love to have you on uh, you know future podcasts because you have a lot of um, interesting ideas. We'll talk about this idea of, this uh, income independence and um, what that means in, you yeah, know, well, especially in today's climate, you know, your jobs are not going to save you anymore. So what is this idea of income? Income independence is, is when you get to that point where you can say, you can make this particular statement. It doesn't matter what happens in the stock market. It can go up, it can go down. doesn't matter. Interest rates can go up or they can go down. doesn't matter. I, my income will, will stay the same <clears throat> or close to the same. And if I don't spend more than I make from that income, uh -huh. my in, I can continue to grow that income. That's income independence. That, uh -huh. you know, it's not vulnerable to the winds of the market. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you have an economic disaster where you're in a country that, gets taken over by a dictator and they come in and they steal all your money. Yeah. Fine. Is that going to happen in the United States? We certainly hope not. And I'm not going to go any further than that politically, but the, the idea is that in, if your money is producing more income than you need to spend, that's income independence. And the wealthier you are, mm -hmm. the higher you can set that so that you know, if you need to take a cruise or two every year, I mean, that's your threshold. You want to make enough income to do that. So if that means you don't have anything invested in Bitcoin because it doesn't pay any income, so be it. <laughs> you have it invested in these closed-end funds that pay enough income so you can see the world. I've yeah. only got three more places on my bucket list. I love how you said if you need to take a cruise, it's like you like it's like it's some people are like a cruise is a luxury, but and for the way you describe it is like that's a necessity. <laughs> well, you know, it is to a point. It is yeah. when you can't afford to do, you know, you got you got three kids in college, mm -hmm. maybe you can't go on a cruise. Yeah. But when when you're just finished you're finishing up paying your granddaughter's tuition. Now you can afford to go on a cruise again. You know what I mean? So I've been, you know, I'm almost, eight, well, I'm a, a year and a month away from being 80. Wow. So, I, so theoretically, I don't have any of those problems anymore. I can do with pretty much what I want to. But my in my mind, I still wow. want to make every penny that I'm spending on those cruises, on that traveling. Yeah. You know, I, I want that in income. Yeah. And with my portfolio generating what it does, I can do that. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, kind of rounding it out. Uh, so what are the common vehicles that you, um, that you're interested in? I know particularly it sounds like equities and sounds like bonds. Um, I'm not sure of any insurance products or no insurance products. No insurance yeah. is for insurance is protection. 
And uh, <clears throat> at my age, I really don't need that anymore. I, I've just cashed in all my old insurance policy. I think insurance is very necessary for young people mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. if something happens, they don't want their wife to be saddled with this expense. If she isn't the actual prime primary money winner, you know, I'm, I didn't mean to be sexist in that, but whoever your whatever your partner, if you want to take care of something, your children you want to take care of, that's what you yeah. need insurance. Yeah. But you, when your insurance are already, my <laughs> my son's already retired. Yeah. You know, my yeah. daughter makes six figures salary with with the company. So they they don't need me anymore yeah. for that. So insurance, life insurance, is not important. Homeowners insurance, that's another story. Um, I, I don't use any insurance or annuity products in my portfolios. I never did, even for the accounts I was managing. Yeah. It was always a split between growth purpose, which is equities, uh-huh. and income purpose, which is stocks, bonds, mortgages, loans, blah, 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 that type of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's, you know, there's a lot to choose from in those two types, two big classes of securities. I've never done individually speculative stuff like wow. uh, like futures i mean i i've never even done options i've yeah. never felt the need for it although i invest in closed end funds that do covered calls and i don't i don't have any qualms about doing that i think yeah. covered calls are safe i just never did them myself you know but i but i can invest in i can buy a closed end fund that invests only in companies that produce uh, real assets, you know, silver, gold, plutonium, whatever those things are, but they'll own 60 or 70 or a hundred companies yeah. that do that. So I have a diversified portfolio mm-hmm. of real asset type investments that are paying me eight or 9% while I'm holding them. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't hold things. I'm not a buy and holder. Yeah. I treat, I treat my investment portfolio like I was running a department store <laughs> and every security is on a shelf. Yeah. And if somebody walks in the door, wants to pay my target profit, my target profit is like 5%. I'm uh-huh. not that, I'm not greedy at all. Uh-huh. And if somebody comes in, they want to pay that. I sell it and I'll pick up another product because they're almost interchangeable parts. Yeah. 200 of them, they all pay like an average 9%. They're all different diversified portfolios. You know, it's it's kind of easy when you boil it down to that level yeah. and think about it. Uh, the buy and hold mentality makes people fall in love with certain securities. Oh, my God, I can't sell that. I love all oh, my Apple. It's, it's dear to my heart. It's, it's more important than my children, yeah. you know, because it's gone up so much. Well, how much does it pay you to keep it? Almost nothing. One percent dividend, perhaps. Yeah. I think. You know, so yeah. I turn that I turn that into something that produces income for me that I can spend. Mm. I, I'm not in love with any security. Everything is for sale. So how do you uh, how do you balance? Because you know, let's say you um, you sell too early, and then let's say you know, like I know people sell too early, and it just keeps going, and they miss out on all yeah. that. You just let it go or you never sell it. There's no such thing as a bad profit and uh-huh. nobody on the planet. None of us know what's going to happen tomorrow. Exactly. Just as yesterday when we were sitting, a lot of people were sitting on some profits. Those profits have disappeared today. Mm. My profits didn't disappear because I took them yesterday mm. and I took some more today, even though they weren't as much of a profit as they might have been yesterday. They were still profits. Yeah. So well, I took them today because I'm going to take that money and now yeah. I'm going to buy other things cheaper tomorrow <laughs> and then I'm going to sell. It's just like I'm running that store. I'm ta- yeah. I'm calling my supplier <laughs> and he says, yeah, oh my God, prices are falling. I said, good. Give me some more of this, that, and the other thing while the prices are down and I'll put them back on my shelves. <laughs> you can't have that attraction. You can't have that love. If you uh-huh. want to be a sick, in my mind, if you want to be a, a successful income uh-huh. investor in the stock market, you yeah. have to, you have to, you have to develop a set of rules for the quality of what you're buying. You have to diversify properly, and then you can safely sell and repurchase the same securities over and over again. I've sold, I think. 
just under 200 different closed end funds already this year. Uh-huh. Like 179 the last I looked. Okay, some of them several times in the space of three months. So, I've generated I've generated profits e- equal to two full months income that these things produce. Mm-hmm. So in, instead of having a 12 month income year this year, yeah. I already have a 14 month income year. Yeah. And by the end of the year, who knows? I mean, I don't know if the price is going to continue to go down or they're going to go back up again. Yeah. But I still have I still will have that same level of monthly income regardless. Yeah, I love that. And the other question I have, I know we're kind of running out on time is this. So, uh, you know, this uh, you mentioned Bitcoin earlier and, you know, earlier on, like in the when it's early infancy, it was almost like, um, you know, it's like, almost like gambling. But now it's actually um, a lot of countries and people are looking at it. I know for the boomer generation, you may not need Bitcoin, but, you know, a lot of millennials and Gen Z, they're like, this is more efficient than gold. And, you know, I don't have to like it's digital. So what are your thoughts on this? this is not advice, but, you know, they have this uh, new ETF. Product. I, I never do anything that I don't totally understand going <laughs> on with Bitcoin, how it can be worth anything at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't equate it to gold. Mm. And and I never was a gold lover either because <laughs> I it's sitting there in my garage. I can't spend it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't go to the pharmacy and say, here, give me my prescriptions. Right. You know? <laughs> so I, I, I've I've never been a, pl- a a fan of metals. I I buy the companies that do it. You can buy you can buy Bitcoin now in an ETF, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, right yeah. now there are no CEFs that I know of that have Bitcoin and there's no Bitcoin investment I know of that pays dividends yeah, yeah. or interest or income of any kind. And I don't do anything like I like my dad told me when I was 13 years old, right. do not do anything that doesn't pay you for the use of your money. Oh, I see. Interesting. I mean, I've become a fairly wealthy individual without ever doing that kind of gambling or speculation. Yeah, I love that. You um, know, when I go to a casino, I'd have a hundred dollar yeah. limit. <laughs> I'll either make money or I'll lose a hundred dollars and that's it. You know? So. Yeah. How can people find you and check out your book and reach out to you and, you know, reach out to you, you know, pick your brain. Uh, well, that, that cost, <laughs> except for your <laughs> listeners, it, the book is cheap. It's at uh, Amazon. It's at every place else you can get it. You can get it on the ebook, the other ebook entities that just sell electronic copies. That's one way to reach me. And my uh, my Facebook groups are mentioned in there, and my website, which is theincomecoach.net. Uh-huh. And there you can read about what I do is my coaching capacity. I'll I'll have Q and A sessions with you. I'll look at your existing portfolio and make suggestions or i'll coach you in how to transition from your three percent environment to an eight or nine percent environment awesome so yeah. that's that's me and for all the audience out there let's thank steve for coming on check out his book you know you want to reach out to him for coaching his all of his links will be in the uh, show notes um and uh with that thanks so much for coming on my pleasure nice talking to you yeah.